Hi everybody, we're going to talk about cut flowers now. And it's nice to take some flowers out of your garden and bring them inside and put them in a vase and enjoy them indoors. And here to talk to us about some of her favorite cut flowers and how to grow and cut them is Barb Lashkowitz. She's a research specialist here at NDSU. Barb, welcome to the forums. Thank you very much, Tom. Welcome everybody to the last night of spring fever garden forms <clears throat> and hopefully the snow will be disappearing soon and we can actually get out and grow some flowers for our homes so what i want to talk about is um like tom said growing your own cut flowers some ones that work well some ones i'm not necessarily going to mention ones that don't but certainly you can ask me about specific ones that i don't mention and just take a look at how we can harvest them and then bring them in and keep them alive as long as possible in our homes. So first of all, I just want to talk about the criteria for a good cut flower. And one of the main criteria is that it has a long stem length, so it will go into a vase. So something like alyssum that's very low to the ground is probably not considered a real good cut flower. Another good thing is that they last up to a week or 10 days in a vase. They have, they should produce lots of flowers, but certainly when we talk about perennials, um, there's a limited quantity to harvest from, and they should be easy to grow. I'm all about low maintenance, and um, the easier the better. Some other things you might think about is fragrance, and certainly in the spring with the lilacs blooming, they're very short-lived, but that nice fragrance they give off is wonderful as well as some um, lilies that we can grow and then if you do have allergies you might want that in mind too you don't want to be sneezing with all the flowers in your house so let's just talk a minute about the site where you would grow um, cut flowers and you know everybody out there is already a gardener so you know there's some important things to think about for blooming plants so I don't want to spend a lot of time here but usually the Plants that bloom the best are going to need six or more hours of sun a day. You want to protect them from the wind, and maybe that's not something you think about with regular flower gardens, but some of the cut flowers, once they get taller, the wind tends to blow them over. So if you do have a windy spot, you might need to stake them over the course of the summer. Um, look where your water source is. You don't want to be dragging water. Some of these might require a little more water to keep up the good bloom. And then you also want good drainage so you don't have them waterlogged. And with any other type of gardening, if you have an issue with your soil and if you want to know if it needs nutrients or if it's lacking in something, you might want to have it tested. And that's the website for the NDSU Soil Testing Lab. And you can get all the details of how to do that there. So two different ways you can also grow cut flowers, um, specifically with annuals, you can make rows of cut flowers and making them accessible so when you pick, you can just walk along the rows and pick. But you might have an existing landscape. And again, more often with perennials, we see this. And then you might be harvesting plants within the landscape and that works perfectly well, also just depending on what kind of gardener you are. Okay, so let's talk about harvesting in particular. Best time to get out and harvest is usually right away in the morning. The earlier the better. When it's still cool out, the plants aren't going to be water stressed from the heat of the day. You're not going to get hot out there cutting. You should have a, the sharpest knife or shears that you have to cut the stems. And then there's two ways you can do it. You can either carry a bucket of water with you so that as soon as you harvest them, you can put them right into water. That might get a little cumbersome though. So you can, there are a few exceptions, but you can harvest them without the water, bring them back to where you have water, and then just recut the stems, maybe cut an inch or two off the bottom before putting them into water. Um, one exception that I can think of off the top of my head are hydrangeas, which are really, they love water. So you might want to have water for those as you harvest them. But most other things, they'll do okay being cut for a little bit before you get them into water. So stage of development is also important. And those of you that already 
cut flowers and bring them into your house probably just intuitively know this as you cut. But there's three main stages. And um, it's very important with some that you cut them at the proper stage or you won't get as much enjoyment out of them. So the first is the bud stage. These are solitary type flowers that will continue to open after you harvest them. So things like peonies and iris, which hopefully we'll be seeing shortly, roses and the lilies. Um, you can cut those when they're just hardly opening and they will continue to grow and mature so you can have them around for quite a while. Then we have spike type flowers and some examples here are the larkspur, glad, snapdragons, and then plumes off of our ornamental grasses. I love working with grass plumes. But you want to get these when one or two flowers are starting to open and color is showing on the other buds and they will continue to open. Then as the blossoms die, you just pluck them off and the upper ones will keep blooming. Grass plumes in particular, you want to get them early. If you harvest them when they're too mature, they shatter and it causes a mess all over. And the last stage are the fully open flower head types. So these are the composite type flowers usually, sunflowers, marigolds, the zinnias and the asters. They do not like to be cut in the bud stage. They will not, well they may open a little bit more, but usually once they're fully open, that's when we wanna get them at. So what about the bugs? Because we all know in the summer, there's lots of bugs everywhere and we don't necessarily wanna be bringing them into our home and certainly thrips are a big issue especially with things like snapdragons um, spider mites might be a problem flies are everywhere so they might come in regardless but sometimes ants on the peonies are making an announced appearance so i guess what i try to do after i harvest them i might take my garden hose and rinse them off really good and kind of give them a shake and then i'll arrange them in my kitchen sink wash them off again, see what falls off, and then just put them out. And if I, if I get something creepy crawly, then I do. I'm not, I'm not a big, I don't have a problem with it. Certainly if you really don't want any critters in your house, um, you might not want to be bringing flowers in from your garden. So let's take a quick look at arranging the flowers. And really the easiest thing to do is to just get some fresh water in a vase and plop them in there. Um, mason jars that we see here on the bottom right, they're really trendy right now. I like to dress them up with a little bit of raffia or a bow to kind of finish them off. Most flowers will just do really good with nice clear water. Now there is a trick with vases. If that big thing frustrates you because you put your flowers in and they flop all over, a, a really quick, easy thing you can do is make a grid over those. And I've got three tapes here that <clears throat> for sure you might have scotch tape or masking tape at your home. The one on the left is the florist tape that they use. I just make a grid, it makes smaller holes, and then you put your flowers in. Once there's enough stems in there, they'll support each other. And at that point, what I like to do is pull the tape off so you don't see it. Certainly if you're using something like a scotch tape or a clear tape, you can leave it on, but um, sometimes the tape starts getting in the way and then you would want to remove it as well. Another fun thing to do with the clear bases is to fill them like halfway up with pebbles or marbles and that will also give you a nice base to support your flower stems. Florist foam is also a possibility, although most people normally don't have this sitting around their house. It's like a sponge that soaks up the water and you can get it at any craft store. You soak it up, you put it in your container, and then you insert the stems into the foam. And then you wanna make sure that container stays full of water so the foam retains that moisture as well so your flowers can live as long as possible. But I guess most people are more likely to just have bases hanging around than blocks of floral foam. So how do we make sure our flowers last as long as possible? And this is whether you're bringing them in from your garden or if you get a bouquet from a florist. These are all good tips to get them to last as long as possible. 
And the key with flowers, and they've done some studies on this, is the cooler you can keep your flowers, the longer they're going to last. So you want to keep them out of any direct sun. Even if you have a nice, bright, sunny bay window and the flowers would look gorgeous there, you don't want to necessarily put them there because the heat of the sun will really dry them out and, and shorten their base life. Keep them out of any drafts from a furnace or an air conditioner. And the way this spring is going, our furnace might be running more than our air conditioner. But that air also will dry the flowers out and shorten their lives. And then keep them away from any appliances that might give off heat. You want to pull off any foliage that's going to be under the water because that will decay in the water and that bacteria that grows from that decay will clog your stems up. Check the water, change it every two or three days, especially if it's starting to look cloudy. And as you do that, you also might want to recut your stem in so any blockages that might inhibit the uptake of the water. And then you can also use flower food in the water. Again, there have been many studies done that show that commercial flower food does extend the base life of flowers. It provides a source of food. It lowers the pH of the water, which makes it more drinkable for the flowers. And it also keeps the water clean, which you know keeps the bacterial and the fungal growth down. So you can check with your local florist and they may have this available for purchase. Or whenever you do buy flowers from a florist, you should get a little packet of food that goes usually in a quart or a liter of water. Um, some other tips before we get into some specific flowers um, with the annuals. The more you harvest, the more they will produce. So you want to get out and harvest early and often so that they keep growing and producing. With perennials, of course, that's not going to be the case because typically they have a set number of buds, but then you just have to plant more of the perennials to get more of the flowers. And then if you really want to get a different, a diverse selection, I might suggest starting your own seeds. Of course, that's a whole other talk about starting flowers and, and all that stuff. But there are a lot of fun things. These are three catalogs I've ordered out of. Um, Johnny's in particular is seems to be a little more toward the farmer's market and the, not the commercial, but the growers for not only cut flowers, but also produce but they all have a good selection of stuff. So let's um, talk about some specific annuals. And there's many I haven't included, and I guess it's just for you guys to go experiment and grow your own and see, see what works well. So the first few slides are some specific bases I have put together and the flowers I used, and then I have just specific flowers. But the first one, is a base that has lisianthus and scabiosa, basil, basil foliage, and purple fountain grass. And lisianthus is probably one of my favorite cut flowers because it just cut flower. It's got a long stem. It's got a long base life. The double blossomed ones resemble roses. The colors are lavender, pink, white, and then some mixtures of them. So they just work really well. There are some shorter lisianthus that don't work as well. So if you're going to grow them, I would try to get the taller ones. Scabiosa, this is the annual scabiosa, um, also called pincushion flower. Also very nice with a long stem, and I found them very easy to grow. So basil foliage might be something that you wouldn't think of too. But it's just got a really nice um, texture and color to it. Then you get that nice fragrance, makes you hungry, want some pasta, and it just, it's a nice filler. And then the purple fountain grass leaves, leaves would work. The flower heads work well also, but again, with the heads, you want to make sure you harvest them when they're really young so they don't shatter. Okay, here's a real simple base with zinnias and malinus, which is pink paintbrush grass. And this is a really nice annual grass as well. My photo doesn't do it justice. The flower heads do look like pink paint brushes, just a really pretty vibrant pink. And again, my zinnia photo is not, but it paired really well with a pink zinnia. You know, simple, easy, not a lot of thought, just pop them in a base. And again, the zinnias, you want to harvest them when they're fully open. And then 
On the top left is dahlias, again with the basil. I'm kind of late getting on the dahlia bandwagon, but they also are wonderful cut flower and last up to a week in a vase. The red fountain grass, you can kind of see with the dahlias there. And then if you look closely at that vase, that clear glass vase, I took a variegated leaf and wrapped it around the outside, which is another fun thing to do with the vases that gives a unique texture and color to it. Then the bottom shot is coreopsis, again with basil, and fountain grass. Very simple and, and fun to do. All right, just some straight flowers now. Snapdragons, glads, very common spiky flowers. The thrips do like these flowers, though. If you don't like thrips in your house, you want to steer clear of these. And then Agastache, that's um, also hyssop. It's a member of the mint family. And so it's one that when you harvest, you're going to get a licorice scent or a bubblegum scent, some fun things there. Status and Gumfrina are two um, typically dried flowers, but you can also work with them fresh or you can harvest them and dry them and keep them around later. Gumfrina, again, I just love the texture, the look. Doesn't have super easy to grow, doesn't have a lot of insect problems. The one on the right is called fireworks and it looks like little explosions of fireworks in your garden. Okay, Origeron, it's the purple pineapple -y one on the left, and that's another one that the whole plant is that purplish blue color. And I have actually picked these and put them in a vase with no water, and they just they're like dried flowers already, and then they last. You can have them in a vase all winter long, and they do start to fade eventually, but you've got that nice texture. Amaranth on the top right, it's very trendy now with that, you know, hanging pendulous flower. And um, love lice bleeding is its common name. And then helichrysum or straw flower, another dried type flower that you can harvest it, and it will dry, and you can use it all year long. Again, the grasses, I love working with the grasses. Annual fountain grass on the top left, we see quite often. Sweet potato vines, if you grow those, you know, and if they're really growing wild, everywhere you can chop them up, give them a good haircut, put them in water, they'll root, you can get more plants. And then the cypress, the papyrus, king tut and baby tut, also give a unique texture and look into the flower designs. Okay, some perennials and woody plants to take a look at. And I'm going to go from spring down to fall with these because we all know they have certain bloom times and bloom frames. Tulips and daffodils are starting to come up right now, even though the snow, I mean, daffodils are probably one of the first things to start popping their heads up. And they are nice for cut flowers, but they really don't last very long. They, you really need to keep these cool. Don't expect them to, to give you that week of color unfortunately and then lilacs as well they're incredibly short-lived in a vase but it's so nice to bring them in and have that fragrance in your home and don't forget about branches before they leaf out um, willow dogwood for scythia are fun accents and then if you get them late enough in the winter they should break bud in your home and then you've got another accent as well so going late spring, early summer, of course, the irises with their nice fragrance and the peonies. And then baptisia. I don't know if any of you grow that, but that has a real pretty flower and a nice foliage as well. Alliums. And there's so many different sizes of alliums. They're great as a perennial and a cut flower. Delphiniums, a nice spike. They're a little more um, temperamental to grow in your garden than they probably are going to need staking. But another nice spike flower. and you know, echinacea, it's a very coarse looking flower. I don't know if people think of it as a cut flower, but it's certainly, I've worked with it before and it, it's very tough. Hosta foliage. I saw in somebody's office once, just a low vase with a single big hosta leaf in it. It was just so striking and simple. And there's so many different kinds of variegated and chartreuse and dark colored foliages that that's an option I would think. And then the flowers, people don't like the flowers, but they smell good and they, they will last in a vase as well. Roses, of course, kind of everybody loves a, a nice fragrant rose. And then hydrangeas are nice. 
not only cut fresh, you can leave them on the plant till fall, let them dry, and then cut them and spray paint them and have some fun Halloween or Christmas looks with those also. Okay, getting into later summer, Liatris, of course, is a typical florist flower. It does attract monarchs, though, so if you don't want to discourage the monarchs, you might want to leave them out there. Many types of lilies. The Orientals have the nice fragrant. There's Asiatics as well. And then perennial, um, this is feather reed grass, Calamagrastis. Again, those heads are nice to work with. And finishing up in the fall, asters are nice, and asters are great because they will, will get like a 30, 32 degree temperature, and their color just gets deeper and better. Mums, of course, are also a nice one. And then solidago, the golden rods, are a really nice cut flower. They don't cause your hay fever, so feel free to bring them in and enjoy them in your home as well. All right, so I just, again, there's a lot I left out. But just, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. And, you know, gardeners should always take notes on everything so you know what works and what doesn't. So just do that and you'll be fine. And that's okay, it. Okay, that's great.